Cool. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Carl Steinbach, and I'm here with Simon King. And today we're going to talk about Dr. Elephant. Um, so I think in order to understand our motivations for building Dr. Elephant, it's a little bit about the history of um, Hadoop at LinkedIn. So back in 2006, LinkedIn built a feature called People You May Know. Um, I think it should be pretty familiar to anyone who's used LinkedIn and uh, other uh, similar sort of systems now supported as well. Um, at the time, uh, People You May Know was running or implemented on top of Oracle. Uh, the uh, feature was a huge success, and it became sort of the engine of LinkedIn's growth, um, which is both good and bad. Really good in the sense that uh, we had many more members joining the site, uh, really bad in the sense that um, by 2008, it was taking that Oracle database about six months to run through the entire data set to generate new recommendations. So um, people knew that they had to find uh, a better approach. And it was around this time that uh, Yahoo had open sourced uh, Hadoop. And some engineers, a small group of engineers at LinkedIn, started looking at Hadoop as a possible way of improving the speed of uh, people you may know. Um, when I joined LinkedIn around 2013, I went to Jira and I dug out the original uh, ticket um, related to building the cluster. It's kind of interesting to look at the uh, series of comments because it, I think, uh, reinforces the fact that in 2008, no one really knew how to run Hadoop um, outside of Yahoo. There were no books available on the subject. Um, and uh, I think people, through sort of trial and error, figured out what to do. You may notice here that they're talking about running it on Sun hardware. Um, there was a lot of uh, effort to uh, figure out how to make it work on Solaris, which is, uh, you know, in, in hindsight, kind of amusing. Um, anyway, this uh, first project was a huge success. Um, they were able to bring uh, the PYMK run from six months down to about a day, and that was running on, I think, 12 nodes. Uh, other engineers at LinkedIn heard about this, and uh, pretty soon everyone um, was trying out Hadoop. So that brings us to 2014. So uh, in 2014, the size of our cluster footprint had grown quite a bit. We had uh, upwards of 10 clusters, upwards of 10,000 nodes. Um, and I think the, the most important thing I want to draw attention to here is that we had on the order of 1,000 users. And uh, these users uh, included uh, developers, engineers, data scientists, business analysts, uh, the whole gamut. Uh, and they were doing many, many different things on the cluster. Um, they were writing queries, building workflows. Uh, they were using um, Pig, Hive, Scalding, Goblin, and Qbert, uh, as well as Spark, uh, and many frameworks that people uh, had built for themselves. Um, I think from you know, the, the earliest days, uh, no restrictions were placed on what people were allowed to do on Hadoop. Uh, and as a result, uh, many people, when they encountered a problem, they would solve it uh, themselves. So, on the one hand, uh, I think this allowed people to move very quickly, which is great, um, but it also created a lot of entropy um, in the system. So one thing that we sort of discovered along the way is that uh, Hadoop and Spark, I think more than really any other system I'm familiar with, um, sort of forces you to make a choice between whether you want developers to be productive in terms of uh, the rate at which they're able to solve problems, or uh, how efficient you want your infrastructure to be. Um, I think there's a, a big distinction really between getting something to work on Hadoop and Spark and getting it to work efficiently on Hadoop and Spark. And it's very hard to tell someone who's gotten something to work, well, hey, actually, your job is only half done because it's killing the cluster uh, and we need you to uh, spend some time tuning it. Uh, and once you're finished tuning it, well, then we need you to spend some time uh, for the future uh, actually monitoring it and making sure that it doesn't go out of tune. So we tried a couple of different approaches to sort of resolve uh, this choice, to get to a point where people could be both productive uh, and um, build jobs that were efficient and uh, didn't kill the cluster. So one thing we tried was training. Um, people on my team uh, spent a lot of time putting together curriculums, uh, having office hours, uh, running presentations, telling people how to tune jobs. Um, and we found, for one thing, uh, this took a lot of time up from us, which we weren't able to spend uh, fixing bugs or adding features to Hadoop or Spark or um, building tools that allowed people to do things more efficiently. Um, it also interfered with the productivity of the people we were teaching because this was a distraction from uh, you know, the actual goals of their job, building applications, uh, you know, finding insights from data, things like that. 
Um, another system we tried was expert review. So we had a um, policy in place for a long time where in order to get your workflow promoted from our development cluster to the production cluster, you would have to fill out a survey, uh, sort of accounting for different metrics from your job, uh, and then enter a queue and wait for about a month for someone from my team to review that uh, form and then meet with you personally. And roughly half the time, uh, the result would be that you would get sent back uh, with some homework to do. You'd have to change a couple settings and then enter the queue again and wait another month. So not surprisingly, this was a very, very, very unpopular uh, uh, system that we had. Um, there were a lot of complaints about it. Uh, and as bad as it was for users, it was also bad for us because uh, we were spending a lot of time looking at these uh, forms that people had filled out uh, and things like that. So we tried to find um, a better approach. We also sort of looked at the problem itself and tried to understand uh, why are Hadoop and Spark so hard to tune. So one issue is that there are just too many knobs. Uh, and I think a lot of this just has to do with the fact that uh, these systems are open source and they don't really have a product manager. And if you ever wondered what a product manager does as an engineer, well, product managers make sure that you don't have a thousand knobs uh, to turn. They focus on building a, a usable system. Um, another issue is that there are too many frameworks, each with its own uh, unique configuration settings. Uh, still another problem is that even if you do manage to tune your job uh, at one given point in time, it can quickly fall out of tune as the uh, shape of the input data changes. For example, you can develop SKU, you can develop GC problems in different stages. Uh, and related is the problem of basically that uh, there's the tedious task of just monitoring your job uh, as it changes over time. There's a book that uh, was published a couple of years ago called Hadoop in Practice uh, by Alex Holmes. This is a flow chart from that book, uh, which shows basically the simple process uh, of tuning your job. Um, this is actually the only book I'm aware of on Hadoop or Spark that includes something like this. Uh, so I think this is sort of the, the best example I've seen of, uh, you know, the, the real sort of thought process that uh, a user would need to apply in order to consistently get good results when tuning their jobs. We looked at this and realized, well, actually, this is kind of the sort of task that an expert system uh, you know, would be really good at solving. Basically taking a decision tree, applying it to a set of input data, uh, and then figuring out the results. And that is, in essence, what Dr. Elephant is. So it's a system that, uh, or service that uh, provides performance monitoring and tuning to users. Uh, Dr. Elephant uses heuristics, basically rules, uh, which it applies to the log output and metrics of a job. And it uses this to identify performance pathologies. And once it's identified these pathologies, uh, it provides actionable advice to users, telling them precisely what they need to do in order to solve the problem. Much like a doctor, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, hey, your test results look bad, here's what you need to do. Stop eating so much fat, you know, whatever. Uh, so another thing Dr. Elephant does is it has a health history of a job over time. So you can see uh, how performance changes uh, in, uh, you know, as a result of changes that you make as well as changes uh, to the infrastructure itself or the input data. So in terms of implementation, uh, Dr. Elephant uh, uses the Yarn Resource Manager uh, in order to find jobs that are running. It then has two different pipelines, uh, one for MapReduce jobs and one for Spark jobs, where it goes and either fetches uh, information from the uh, MapReduce job history tracker or from the uh, Spark history server. Uh, and these uh, results then get fed into uh, either MapReduce heuristics or Spark heuristics. And finally, the results are written to a database, in this case, MySQL. Subsequently, when a user goes to the Dr. Elephant service, uh, these results are presented in a straightforward manner along with uh, tips on what to do. So here's an example of the uh, landing page that users see when they pull up Dr. Elephant. Uh, we, uh, and you can also see sort of down here, uh, these are the different uh, heuristics uh, which Dr. Elephant applies to jobs, in this case, a pig job. And you can see that Dr. Elephant has flagged uh, the job for a mapper memory issue as well as a reducer memory issue. Uh, the results are color-coded, green meaning good, red meaning bad, so it's easy for people to see uh, whether uh, a job is healthy or not. 
And here's an example of the pane, which allows users to see how performance has changed over time. So we open sourced Dr. Elephant in April of last year. It's on GitHub. Um, since open sourcing it, a number of other companies have uh, adopted it and put it into production. Um, a lot of these companies have also decided to contribute to Dr. Elephant. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, in the near future, as in this week or next week, uh, we're going to submit a proposal to Apache to have Dr. Elephant enter the Apache incubator. So at this point, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Simon King, who's going to talk about some of the recent work in Dr. Elephant to um, add more heuristics for Spark. Hi. You can hear me. Um, so I'm going to introduce a little bit about uh, the Spark-specific features of Dr. Elephant. I'm going to start with Spark event logs, which are sort of the source of truth for what happened in your Spark application. Spark history server, which you may know is your best tool for viewing those event logs. Um, then talk about Dr. Elephant, which offers some you know, interpretation on top of that raw data. Um, and then I'll introduce Pepperdata's application profiler, which is a commercial repackaging of Dr. Elephant. So the Spark history server, probably most of you have dealt with this at some point. Um, this is the Spark 1.6 history server, which doesn't offer any search features. Uh, you know, in newer versions of Spark, you get some limited search. But this basically shows you all your recent applications with you know, some high-level statistics, their duration. Uh, you can drill down into any of these and find out just about any data you want about your application. Um, in this case, you know, maybe I'm curious about uh, the execution time of my tasks. But this is fairly raw data. I don't know that it's bad that my slowest task took 50% longer than my fastest task. This is just data. There's no interpretation there. It's not actually the rawest form of data. There are actually these event logs that have events for everything that happened in your application. An executor was launched, a task failed, a task completed. Um, anybody out there actually ever dealt with a Spark event log? I'm sorry. Um, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's too bad. They aren't really for human consumption. They're you know, lines and lines of JSON events that you might have hundreds of thousands or millions of these in a very large application. Um, if you have dealt with these, please uh, come talk to us about contributing to Dr. Elephant. You're the kind of people we want. Um, but for the rest of you, you know, Spark History Server is a good interface to dealing with this. Uh, it's also the same source of truth that Dr. Elephant uses. Dr. Elephant packages, packages this in a slightly different way. You'll, this is sort of what Carl showed, but these are Spark jobs here. You got your search stuff on the left. Um, you can search for different severity levels, your unhealthiest jobs. You could say, I only want the critical ones, or I only want to see the good ones, though that seems a less likely case. Um, in general, this highlights jobs that have problems that can be simply fixed. This shows the jobs that have the most common problems that can be most easily fixed. This is a triage system. Pay a little bit of attention to these jobs, and you'll get the biggest bang for your buck. Um, here's another one sorted by severity. So this top job is, is quite unhealthy, and it's got all sorts of problems. Um, some of the things in there, is this my pointer? I don't know how to turn on my pointer. Um, you'll see some things like this are in indicative of waste of this job. It's uh, used 18 gigabyte hours, but it's actually wasted 78% of that. There's something wrong with that job. We've got to go in there and look at it. We click on it, and we get more data. In this case, this executor's metric is severely wrong. It shows distribution of a variety of things across your executors. Uh, probably the most important one is the time skew. You don't want one executor to take much longer than the others because the others are just sitting on their hands waiting for the slow guy to finish. This is still somewhat tough to interpret, so I uh, click that explain link there, and Dr. Elephant tells me more about this heuristic and some about what to do with it. Uh, in this case, it's doing a fairly simple analysis of the distribution of various metrics across your executors, looking at the max to median, and if that ratio exceeds some threshold, it sets that heuristic to you know, moderate or critical. Um, it explains a little bit about why you don't want skew there. And then it tells you something about what to do to fix this. 
Um, in this case, you probably want more partitions in your, uh, in your data, which will result in more tasks. You'd like to have a number of tasks, that's some multiple of your number of executors so that they all can do sort of the same amount of work. So that's probably the first thing you try here. There might be some key skew where actually all your executors have the same number of tasks to deal with, but some of them somehow got more difficult data to deal with. Um, you might also experiment with speculative execution where you can try the same task in multiple places and the guy who finishes it first will win. There might actually be other causes for executor skew here that Dr. Elephant doesn't ne necessarily help you with. There might be bad cluster weather, as Jules mentioned, where one executor got pinned on a node that was busier than the others, and somebody else was using all the CPU or all the uh, network bandwidth on that node, and that executor got starved for some resource it needed. Um, there are basically three classes of heuristic that Dr. Elephant is dealing with now for Spark. Configuration heuristics uh, show you your configuration settings for your app. Uh, not all of them, but the ones that Dr. Elephant con considers important. It'll complain if some of these aren't explicitly set. Uh, for instance, it likes you to use the cryo serializer. It thinks that's the fastest one now, so if you don't set that, it'll complain. Um, it'll recommend that you use an external shuffle service. It'll complain quite loudly about that if you're using dynamic allocation, because then you could lose work if you don't have an external shuffle service. Uh, in general, these don't change over time. Uh, these are configuration. It's, you run the same configuration, you get the same results for this heuristic. They aren't data dependent. There's a small chance that some system defaults that your application inherits uh, change, and in that case, this might change, but it probably, it probably won't change. This is to catch either bonehead mistakes or configuration settings that you're not familiar with. Um, there are things that in Dr. Elephant right now are called stages and job heuristics. These are simple alerts or alarms on high failure rates. Spark History Server won't highlight these issues to you. If your job succeeded after having numerous stage failures that were retried and succeeded, Spark History Server glosses over that. Your job ran slow, but you don't really know why. Uh, Dr. Elephant will highlight these. They're somewhat trickier to debug. It doesn't always have the best recommendations for, to do that, but it's a good thing to keep an eye on. This will show you, you know, if your job had numerous stage failures over time, maybe it's the data has changed in some way that your job isn't prepared to parse this new data shape. So this is a good thing to you know, notice, maybe not act on. The executor heuristic that I showed earlier looks at these distributions across a number of metrics, uh, input bytes, memory used, time distributions. And in general, the, the best remedy for these is to change your partitioning. Um, but as I mentioned, it also could be cluster weather, which I'll get into later. Another way to uh, manage your partitions is this partitions heuristic, which is based on a really excellent blog from Cloudera, which is two years old, but still relevant in many ways. Oh, and my slide got uh, messed. That line should be a, uh, between those two lines. That should be a ratio of the first line of things over the other line of things. Um, the idea behind this one is you want the data for a given task to fit in the RAM available to that task. And you can determine how much RAM is available to a task by looking at the executor memory divided by the number of cores. That's how much memory each task gets. Um, it's a little bit tricky to figure out how much of that was actually used. You look at the spill, and you have to modify that some because uh, data takes up a different amount of space in memory and on disk. But there's this formula that you could actually pull data out of Spark History Server and apply this formula yourself and try to get an optimal number of partitions. Or you can just let Dr. Elephant do it for you. Every time you run your application, it'll tell you when your partitioning may be suboptimal. Uh, without this, your best bet is probably try increasing partitions. More partitions are, in general, better. Every time you run your application, you could increase the partitions by 50% and keep doing that until you no longer see any benefit. Um, but you know that's, that's not the fastest way to get anything done. And eventually, you can actually have too many partitions. If you have too many partitions, no task is using all the RAM available to it. You've allocated more RAM than you're actually using. And at the extreme case, you run into some slowdowns with task deserialization. Um, so that's a small set of heuristics. Um, it would be great to have more. Dr. Elephant is open source. Anybody's well, uh, welcome to contribute additional heuristics or just contribute suggestions for heuristics. We think the 
set we have now is actually a, a pretty good set. It's a, an example of the 80-20 rule, that 20% of the causes are gonna create 80% of the effects. When you fix these simple problems, um, you'll probably see a fair amount of performance benefit. But there, there are other ones we're considering now. You know, we don't have anything on garbage collection. There may be an optimal size or at least a maximum size per executor before your garbage collector gets in trouble. Um, there may be very simple ones, like you don't want fewer tasks than you have executor cores, or some of them are gonna be sitting around doing nothing. Um, that Cloudera blog has some good suggestions for maximizing your HDFS throughput. Uh, it suggests uh, no more than uh, five, ex uh, five cores per executor uh, or HDFS will slow down. I'm not sure that's still true, that as people move to flash storage, that may, may be slightly off. We need to experiment more with that. Um, on to Pepper data and why we chose to adopt Dr. Elephant. Our existing products were capacity optimizer and policy enforcer, which are things that run on your Yarn cluster and just make it go better. Uh, cluster analyzer is a product that collects many, many metrics from your cluster. Uh, several hundred different types of metrics, both, both at the node and process level, that are sampled every five seconds. Vast amounts of data uh, that are probably best visualized as time series. In this case, these are uh, aggregated by job, aggregating all the containers for a job over the cluster. You can see maybe how the jobs interact. Uh, on the right there, you know, this one job is using a lot more memory than others, and it may be suppressing the memory available to others. Uh, either causing them to do more GC or causing some scheduler lag and trying to find container spaces for those. And this might be a great view for your cluster operator, seeing how some jobs don't play nice together. Um, but it's not necessarily the best view for you as a developer to figure out what went wrong. It may tell you that, yes, the cluster weather was bad. There were other applications interfering with yours, but it doesn't tell you how to improve it. We have other visualizations sort of on the same type of data. This, this one is... Uh, about uh, distribution of disk usage across nodes. Um, for a while here, you'll, oops, wrong button. You'll see that the 95th percentile of nodes were using a lot more space than the median nodes. Somebody performed some, some sort of rebalancing action there on May 15th and everything smoothed out. But again, that's probably more for a cluster operator than, uh, than for the developer. And we actually had a customer say, well, why don't you do something like Dr. Elephant? And we thought, Oh, we'll actually do Dr. Elephant. And that was the genesis of our application profiler, which was briefly internally called Dr. Pepper, you know, Dr. Elephant plus Pepper data, but we thought that might not fly with Snapple or whoever owns Dr. Pepper now. Um, so application profiler does the same thing as Dr. Elephant, giving simple answers to simple questions, but it integrates with Pepper data's other products, Cluster Analyzer, to get you the uh, the more detailed metrics for experts to drill down into uh, harder to answer questions. It's not the 20% common causes that cause most of your things. It's one of the weird ones that kind of scattered 80% of weird behavior that you could drill down to, drill down into and explore with Pepperdata's other software. Um, another advantage of application profiler over Dr. Elephant is it's commercially packaged. You know, we take care of it for you. Dr. Elephant um, is primarily still maintained by LinkedIn. Most of those guys have day jobs. If you go there and you, you, know, you open a GitHub issue or complain on the mailing list, they will help you, but it won't be their first priority. Um, it's also a little bit harder to install Dr. Elephant. You've got to build it from source and install it on your cluster, um, which has some funny things. It's not always common to install a SQL database on your cluster. It may be hard to figure out where to do that. Uh, the Dr. Elephant process is also the one that serves the UI, so that'll be somewhere on your cluster. It may not be network accessible to your manager. It probably is to you if you're submitting jobs to your cluster, but maybe not to your manager. Um, so uh, Dr. Elephant right now is uh, Apache licensed. We could have chosen to just steal the code um, or you know, build our own clone of it. Um, we've chosen to stay sort, uh, close to the open source version of it, primarily to share heuristics. Uh, we hope that as more of our customers see Application Profiler, we get exposed to a, a 
broader swath of cluster configurations and different types of applications and different types of data that can inspire us to create new heuristics which we can contribute back to the open source. And hopefully the open source community is developing additional heuristics as well, uh, which in Application Profiler we can update for you seamlessly. That happens on our cloud, not on your cluster. Next time you run an application, there'll be additional heuristics there to, you know, not the 20% of common problems, but you'll get the 25% of common problems. Application Profiler looks pretty much like Dr. Elephant. It's the same data. It's organized differently. You know, we've got search at the top. Uh, we've got, you know, slightly more compact row-oriented thing. The, the biggest change is this link here, this column of chart links. And those are what you can drill down into if you want to look at your cluster weather. I click on one of those, and it shows me over here on the right the process level resource usage of my executors. In this case, it's CPU percentage. And on the left, I've got the node level aggregation of all the process processes on that node. Um, and in this case, you can see that this host, uh, DN1, was actually using a lot of CPU before this kicked in and was perhaps suppressing the CPU available to that executor. So that might be a way to uh, diagnose some of the cluster weather problems. There's lots more in Cluster Analyzer to help you do those things. Um, but we think the combination of the, you know, simple answers to simple questions, lots of detail if you care to drill down, is powerful. I think that's about all we've got. Um, there are ways for you to learn more. There's a Pepper Data booth downstairs, booth 101. I'll be there for a fair amount of the afternoon. There's a Dr. Elephant meetup this evening at LinkedIn's offices on 2nd Street. Um, I'll talk there in much more detail about uh, both how we built Application Profiler while staying close to the Dr. Elephant source and about some of the hassles and challenges in adapting Dr. Elephant, which was born in the MapReduce world, adapting it to Spark. Uh, please do go check out the GitHub project, even if you don't want to contribute code. Uh, there are mailing lists and other information there. Or email me and Carl. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carl, and thank you very much, Simon, for that wonderful insight into the pathology of what could actually go wrong. We actually have about three minutes, so if you have any questions, there are mics on the left-hand side, and if you have a question on here, I'll try to run around, but we don't even have time. We only have about... Yes, go ahead. Hey, uh, the first speaker mentioned a book that had that flowchart for tuning a job. What was the name of that book? Uh, I'm actually going to blank on the name, but the author is Alex Holmes. I think it's called Hadoop in Practice. Second edition just oh, yeah. came out, as far as I know. Thanks. Yep. Any other question? Yeah. Here. So good to, so I have two questions. So one is uh, how, uh, if I, I want to uh, rule, so I, I want to add a rule, so how can I add a rule? So uh, should I write uh, uh, some code, or can I write uh, some uh, Excel, or uh, some uh, JavaScript program? Sorry, if, if I have to add a new rule. If oh. you want to add a new heuristic, um, they're written in Scala. If you submit your, uh. if you write your Spark jobs in Scala, they're actually pretty easy to do. Uh, Dr. Elephant has a standard set of data it collects from the Spark history server that's accessible to the heuristics. You munge that up in a, whatever way you choose and use that data to assign a severity to it. And there's you know, a configuration change, and then it just shows up in the UI. Other question is, can, can we uh, monitor the uh, system uh, behavior, like uh, uh, CPU utilization or uh, uh, network utilization uh, with a correlation with a Spark uh, event? Um, right now, Dr. Elephant looks only at the cumulative counters for an entire run of an application. Um, application profiler links to the Pepper Data time series metrics where you can get much more detail about, say, hardware utilization, network utilization. That's not one that I think Dr. Elephant tracks. Uh, but between the two of them, you'll get all that. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Give a big hand to Carl and Simon. And again, they'll be at the meetup, and they have a booth, so stop by and ask any other further questions that you have. Thank you.